Uh, Margaret Campbell and I are the co-chairs of the Garden Clubs Program Committee, and we also are very grateful to Brenda, the incredible Brenda Harrington, for <laughs> support she provides to us for hosting these programs on the library Zoom account. So the Garden Clubs, I want to remind you of a couple of things. The Garden Clubs first winter evening program is coming up one week from today at 6.30 p.m. That's January 26th, also by Zoom. The speaker will be David Yarborough, and he's talking about the history of wild blueberry growing in Maine. If you have not registered for this program yet, you can do that at BelfastGardenClub.org or at the Belfast Free Library website. Also, Garden Club members are encouraged to attend our monthly membership meeting, which begins at 1.30 this afternoon after Jack's presentation. Uh, and our president, Barb Gage, has told us that she has lots of exciting news to share with club members, and she looks forward to seeing many of you there. So therefore, please show up so she can be happy today. A separate Zoom has been sent out for that meeting. So please put any questions that you have for Jack in the chat. Uh, and Margaret Campbell is going to be monitoring those throughout his presentation, and she will read them to Jack when his presentation is over. So as Brenda mentioned, we are delighted to welcome Jack Shada, who is the Stewardship Project Manager at the Coastal Mountains Land Trust today. He is going to be sharing their work on various land projects, including those at the McClellan Poor and Duck Trap Preserves here in the Belfast area, and how they benefit native pollinators. Jack is a 2018 graduate of the College of the Atlantic with a degree in human ecology, and he has worked at the Coastal Mountains Land Trust since 2017. So we will now turn this over to Jack. Thank you so much, Corliss and uh, Brenda for that introduction. As mentioned, if you have a, something doesn't quite make sense that I say, feel free to go ahead and type that question in. Uh, if, if I have a major faux pas, then Margaret will jump on the question and we'll get it sorted out. Otherwise, we will do questions uh, at the end. Um, again, thanks to both the Garden Club and the library for hosting this. I'm very excited to be here with you all and I'll just get into it. Um, a quick disclaimer, I am very much, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a botanist, um, I'm very much a land manager, my expertise is on the ground. Um, in terms of scientific research, knowledge about plants, botany, you all must know way more than I do. Um, so maybe in the, the question section at the end, we can get into little conversations about all the things I don't know, as well as some of the things you all don't know. Um, I will be focused more heavily on invasive plant control than I initially planned to. Um, when I first agreed to do this talk way back in the before times of March 2020, um, we thought the land trust thought we were going to be spending more time at McClellan Poor on native pollinator plantings for various pandemic adjacent reasons. That project was uh, pushed back uh, this year. So we didn't do some of the things I thought we were going to do in 2020. Uh, it will be happening in 2021. Uh, so visit the preserve, look forward to that. Um, so getting right into it, for those who don't know about uh, Coastal Mountains Land Trust, we are a nonprofit organization, so a 501 uh, C3, our headquarters or office is in Camden, uh, but we work in uh, 15 towns along um, Western Penobscot Bay in Knox and Waldo County. On the right, you can see a map of all the towns uh, we work in, including Belfast, Searsport, uh, Northport, Lincolnville, Waldo, um, the towns essentially right around Belfast. Uh, there are neighboring land trusts. If you don't know, there's Georges River Land Trust uh, along the river to the west, uh, to the south, they're based out of Rockland. And then Midcoast Conservancy is a little further uh, west. They're based out of Edgecombe. Uh, so we're a conservation organization. That means we permanently conserve land for human and natural benefit. Um, that's our mission statement. So what that means is through easements and preserves, um, we conserve land, we make it available for you to access. Uh, to date, we've conserved over 12,000 acres, including 7,000 for Waldo County. Uh, my role as a stewardship project manager, I am in charge of uh, 
managing or overseeing that 7,000 acres in Waldo County, uh, which includes 25 preserves, which is land that the uh, land trust owns, as well as conservation easements, which are something that someone else owns. Uh, we manage over 50 miles of trail and 39 miles of shorefront on the ocean, on lakes, and on rivers. Uh, we're made up of over a thousand different members uh, who support our work, over 150 active volunteers, uh, everyone from docents at our Beach Hill Preserve to uh, stewardship volunteers who go out with our weekly work crew, as well as people who help us with mailings, in-office things uh, before COVID that we used to do as well as other volunteer tasks. If you are not a volunteer and you would like to be, uh, please visit our website to learn more. There are seven staff members, including me, that are pictured in the uh, top right. And then we have 15 uh, directors on our board, including, including Courtney Collins, who has joined us today. Uh, that's our office on the bottom right, if you haven't been there. It's in Camden. It's a lovely place to be. When COVID ends, you should stop by to chat. Um, so the bread and butter of what we do is land protection, as I already mentioned. Uh, so that's preserves and conservation easements. This is a picture from our Fernald's Neck Preserve, uh, which is in both uh, Waldo and Knox counties in Lincolnville, if you have not been there. As I said before, preserves we own, while conservation easements are a tool um, wherein a property is permanently conserved, but it is ownership of it is maintained by a private owner. Uh, we as the land trust oversee that easement and make sure that its restrictions uh, apply in perpetuity. Um, so an example of an easement would be, uh, you all know the Round the Mountain Trail in Camden and Rockport along Ragged Mountain. We have over 1200 acres of easement with the main water company uh, that provides uh, public drinking water to a number of towns in and around Camden. They own that property, uh, but there are a bunch of restrictions on what they can do, chiefly that they cannot develop it and that they have to allow us to uh, manage and build around the mountain trail on it. We also run a large number of community programs. Of course, they've been disrupted because of COVID, uh, but in a normal year, we do outdoor education, including talks like this. Uh, currently, we're having a talk series the second Thursday of every month at the, along with the uh, the Camden Public Library. If you're not aware of those, check those uh, talks out. We also have concerts and events. Uh, one of our very popular events, this is Beach Hill uh, on the left. It's our kites and ice cream event from, that was 2019, where any child who came up the hill got a free kite and a free uh, cone of ice cream. Uh, it was great fun. We also do free blueberry picking uh, during the summer that we did do in 2020. Uh, we had over, um, 1,400 people come out to do free blueberry picking this year, which was amazing. And then we also have maps, trail guides, and more info uh, that you can find on our website, uh, which is seen here on the top. And then our trail guide, if you don't have a copy, uh, you will get a copy by becoming a member. And then lastly, uh, we work on stewardship or landscape management. Um, and our goals are to maintain and enhance the ecological values of our properties. Um, so what does that really mean? Well, part of that, it's enhancing uh, biological diversity. Um, we're trying to enhance both the diversity of individuals. Uh, so we don't have, we have a robust set of individuals. This is both flora and fauna that can deal with shocks um, and disturbances to that ecosystem. Additionally, we want lots of species and also a diversity of ecosystem types across the uh, properties that we manage. Uh, we're trying to maintain ecosystem services. This isn't a word that we use very often, uh, but if you are familiar with the concept, it's attempting to say that natural systems are important for uh, vibrant and functioning human economies and societies. Uh, we're also maintaining our properties for sustainable recreation and scenic value. Um, so how do we, the land trust, specifically how do I, as a stewardship project manager, do this? Uh, it's mostly through three things that are all out in the woods, uh, pulling or cutting things. On the left, we have um, trail management. Uh, as I said before, we maintain over 50 miles of trail as well as we build trail most every year. Um, so we're cutting a tree that has 
fallen down. Uh, primarily that's clearing trails, but clearing trails, installing signs, kiosks, uh, maintaining markers and blazes, uh, adding steps, doing tread work, managing water, you know, all the things that go into making uh, trails the wonderful and accessible things that we all love. In the center, we're maintaining boundaries. Uh, we have over 120 miles of boundaries on our properties. Uh, we need those to be clearly marked and visible uh, so that none of our neighbors encroach on our conserved property and potentially cut down the forest, uh, dump waste, or do something else that would detract from the property. And then uh, on the right, we have actual landscape management uh, or vegetation management. In this example, we're pulling uh, invasive honeysuckle at the Stover Preserve in Belfast. Uh, this was an event a number of years ago with the Waldo County Technical School. Uh, a group of about 15 students came out to pull honeysuckle with us. Um, so getting in a little deeper to our ecological management tools, uh, the land trust very much has a, um, a kind of let it be um, ecological management philosophy. We're not against forestry or aggressive uh, vegetation management uh, that you would see in a working forest or in an inland fisheries and wildlife game management area where uh, wildlife managers might take specific actions to benefit uh, key species. In the case of inland fisheries and wildlife, that's primarily game species. For instance, Fry Mountain Wildlife Management Area uh, in Knox and Montville near Belfast. The state does a number of clearings, maintaining clearings there uh, for early successional uh, vegetation communities that benefit deer, among with other actions. We don't do a lot of that at the land trust. Um, that's largely because of uh, our organizational philosophy and history, and then a function of how few of us there are. So there's currently three uh, stewardship managers uh, trying to manage uh, about 12,000 acres. Uh, doesn't leave a lot to go around. Uh, the volunteers help, but we do what we can. Um, so to try to get the most um, kind of effective ecological management, we'll primarily be doing two things. We'll either be doing plantings or we'll be doing invasive species removal. Um, so on the left uh, was this fall. It was a series of plantings of native plants at the new uh, Thorndike Brook Trailhead for the Round the Mountain Trail. I know some of you have been there. Um, and that was attempting to add some more biological diversity to a field uh, near that trailhead, as well as making it a nicer area. Uh, on the right, those are black geotextile tarps that are being laid down on a site of Japanese knotweed. Um, in the Duck Trap River, and we'll talk more about those. Um, so really our main management tool is removing invasives, and then in some specific cases, doing plantings. Um, a, I, a lot of other land trusts do do forestry for active ecological management. We do not. Uh, Great Pond Mountain Trust, for instance, does some more forestry uh, up near Bucksport. Uh, and I can try to answer questions about that at the end if people have them. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to skip over forestry. Um, so for those who don't know, um, the state of Maine's Maine Natural Area Program maintains an invasive plant species list. There are 52 severely invasive plant species uh, on that list, including 33 terrestrial species on the do not sell list uh, that is distributed to nurseries. If you're not familiar with the list in our gardener, it's a good idea to take a look at it. Hopefully you're not propagating any of those species. Uh, when I moved into a new rental property this um, summer in Appleton, I found that there was a nice uh, honeysuckle plant right in the front that is on the list um, that I'm still working with my landowners, my landlords to remove. The most common invasive species, at least on our properties, I don't want to speak across Maine or across the region, uh, but the ones that I spend all of my time dealing with are Japanese knotweed, Asiatic bittersweet, Japanese barberry, 
uh, four different honeysuckle species, multiflora rose, glossy buckthorn, ornamental jewelweed, which is also called a Himalayan balsam, uh, and autumn olive. Uh, those are kind of, I wish I had a zingy name like the terrible eight. Um, they're the real troublesome invasive plant species, the ones that have spread most aggressively and cause uh, the most ecological uh, problems on our preserves. Um, I'll be focusing primarily on Japanese knotweed because I know most about it and we do most of our work on it. Uh, but I can talk a little bit to each of these. And if you have questions about them specifically in your own gardens, uh, please ask at the end. Uh, so this is just four of those Japanese knotweed on the top left. Um, then we have glossy buckthorn on the top right. Uh, the ornamental jewelweed uh, on the bottom right. And then um, uh, multiflora rose on, excuse me, uh, Asiatic bittersweet on the bottom left. Um, that's a zoomed in picture of bitters. Uh, Bittersweet, uh, it is a vine that climbs trees. I'm sure you, you are all familiar with it. Um, so why is it important to remove invasive plants, um, aside from just a, a vague notion that they don't belong? Well, they're incredibly ecologically damaging. Um, so these are just three pictures showing what can happen uh, when invasive plants are left uh, uncontrolled and can spread um, and completely disrupt the natural plant communities of an ecosystem. Um, because invasive species are imported from one area to another where um, their natural predators are not present, uh, they have effectively um, a competitive edge over native species. Um, so particularly those eight that I mentioned, um, are very aggressive, they spread very easily, and they will essentially become a monoculture. Um, in the example on the left, uh, this is the Bronx River in New York near where I grew up. Uh, the trees uh, that predate the Japanese knotweed are still there. Uh, the knotweed doesn't hurt the trees, but it does uh, prevent uh, new tree growth from coming up. So once those trees die, this really will turn into a riparian area of just knotweed, uh, which has detrimental effects both on the riparian area and then on the stream itself uh, because of shade and oxygenation uh, and nutrient loading into the stream. Uh, then we have uh, a forest that a uh, similar story on the bottom left, uh, that's Japanese barberry. Uh, it's doing largely the same thing as the knotweed. Uh, in addition, barberry has a uh, very negative uh, attribute of its very good uh, mouse habitat. Uh, and these mice attract ticks. So forests with lots of barberry tend to be incredibly, incredibly ticky. Uh, an explosion of barberry in Maine's forests in the last 20, 30 years uh, has also tracked along with climate change into an increase of ticks and therefore an increase of Lyme disease. Uh, on the top left, that's bittersweet uh, that's crawled up and is strangling uh, trees in the forest. So if you want to manage invasive species, uh, the first thing to do is to identify uh, where they are and identify the source of the invasive species. If the source of the species are a stream on a neighbor's property, uh, or there's a patch of knotweed that crosses into a neighboring property, you will probably never be able to get rid of it on your own property uh, without dealing with the source in some manner. Otherwise, you'll remove it uh, or mitigate it and control uh, its health, and then it will just come back from its original source. Uh, then make a plan. Try to be realistic about how much time you're going to put in, how long you can do it for. Then be persistent and be adjustable. Sometimes the, you'll find out the initial, um, the initial strategy you had, the initial management technique isn't working as well as you wanted it to. Uh, so it's important to be adjustable and use the best methods available if your goal really is eradication. Um, Eradication is very difficult in many scenarios. You only need to um, reduce the prevalence of the invasive species, but it's important if you don't eradicate it to keep up some level of management. Uh, otherwise, the species will come back remarkably quick. 
Uh, so these are just some management techniques uh, for any of those eight invasives that I'll break down into two categories. So chemical treatment and then organic treatment. The Land Trust historically has done primarily organic treatment for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of these is we have a lot of volunteers who are interested. So it's easy for us to get 5, 10, 15 people together to hand pull, to cut and cover, uh, to use digging tools to remove invasive species. Um, and then also in certain ecologically sensitive areas, not wanting to use uh, chemicals for environmental reasons for uh, controlling spread to other native plants. Uh, and having bi-kill, uh, but chemical treatment can be remarkably effective and rather safe. And the three application methods, not necessarily the pesticides, would be a foliar spray uh, that we would do out of a backpack sprayer. Uh, that is kind of the largest type of uh, chemical treatment we would do. Uh, cutting and painting of certain species. Um, so you have a uh, liquid, um, herbicide mixture that you actually paint on with a paintbrush uh, to the cut species. It works very well for glossy buckthorn. And then stem injection uh, is a very targeted method that has almost no bykill of nearby plants uh, for invasive species. I also want to talk a little bit about biological control. Um, which currently is not uh, very prevalent in the United States and certainly in the late 19th century and early 20th century, there are many examples of biological control for invasive species gone wrong, uh, where certain land managers introduced a new species thinking it would help and they became an invasive species uh, themselves. So if you're wary of biological control, uh, I commend you, but I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, one new development uh, that I actually just learned about uh, in the last six months for controlling knotweed. Um, this is um, a moth species uh, native to Japan. Uh, it's, it's the knotweed silid um, that just in April of last year was approved by the USDA's uh, Technical Advisory Group on Biological Control um, of Weed Species for use as a biological control method of Japanese knotweed uh, in the United States. Um, there's been a lot of promising research primarily in England about the efficacy of this uh, species for controlling knotweed. They only eat knotweed. So once they move through an area and defoliate the knotweed there, uh, if there's no nearby knotweed, they have no place to go uh, and the species uh, will die off. Um, I just wanted to point that out there that this may become a bigger management tool in Maine for dealing with knotweed and there are similar trials going on for other species of plant. So now I just wanted to get into a few case studies. Uh, as Corliss mentioned at the beginning, I'll be talking about the Duck Trap River and the McClellan Poor Preserve. I also am gonna briefly mention the Head of Tide Preserve because uh, there was a great project by the Belfast Transitions Permaculture Group that started in 2015. Uh, the Land Trust didn't directly do, but I wanted to give a shout out to that group and their work. So I'll be going through that a little bit. Uh, this is the Duck Trap River just south of Route 52. If you can see my cursor, that's the Route 52 bridge. Uh, this is where the Duck Trap River is uh, in our service region, uh, Belfast being up here. It's about 15 minutes away on Route 52. Uh, this is a closer in map. Uh, again, this is uh, where uh, Route 52 crosses the river. These um, Red dots on the map are Japanese knotweed sites in uh, 2016. We actually did another survey in 2020. We didn't find any additional sites, which was very good news. As I said before, it's important to find the source. Uh, we believe that the source of the knotweed was um, an excavation project that brought in some fill that had knotweed stems. Uh, where the star is that made it down into the river and established itself in the early 2000s in these sites. Uh, there are about 30 sites in total along the river. These sites range from um, probably 20 square feet to uh, 400 at the largest site. That was the first one we dealt with. Uh, 
just a picture of what an untreated site looks like on the river. This is a picture from 13 years ago before it was treated. Uh, but knotweed kind of takes over a section of the bank. This section of the Duck Trap River is very grassy. Uh, it's important Atlantic salmon ha uh, spawning habitat and having knotweed there uh, posed a really big threat to the functioning ecology of the stream. And so it became a priority of the uh, land trust to remove it. Uh, we began the project in 2007 with most work beginning in 20, 2008. Uh, it was volunteer driven at the time. Uh, that's one of our volunteers, Ron Harrell. And the method they decided to pursue was an organic cut and cover method. So this is Ron after uh, a knotweed site has been cut. Uh, we would often use uh, brush saws, so string trimmers with a metal blade, uh, or it could just be whacked down um, with a machete uh, or some other hand tool. And once it was knocked down, we put these uh, geotextiles down that I showed a picture of before. And then we put stakes in the corner to keep it there. And we would put these tarps on every year at the beginning of the growing season and approximately uh, the first or second week in May. Um, and what they would be doing is preventing the knotweed um, from reaching light, from being able to uh, undergo photosynthesis and strengthen uh, the plant. Uh, knotweed has a very extensive deep and strong rhizome. Uh, so it takes a very long time uh, to actually kill a knotweed plant with this method. Um, some cases would be five years, but there are some sites where even after 10 years of treatment, knotweed are still uh, coming up. If you ever removed one of these tarps during gross growing season, uh, it would be covered with um, knotweed stems that are trying to make it through the tarp. If you know the material I'm talking about, it's pretty thick uh, black fabric. Um, so the knotweed cannot break through it. However, it will go around the edges and through seams. So for approximately 13 years after we put these uh, first tarps down, we had a group groups of monitors, usually four or five people every year, who would go visit all of these tarp sites every two weeks, and they would pull stems and they would record how many they pulled. Uh, so we have data for how effective this project was. Uh, and they would continue that. They would go out um, for the entire growing season, so in between May and October. Then we would pull the tarps uh, that were by the river uh, that were close to the flood floodplain so they would not be uh, covered in sand for the next year. Because the ultimate goal is not to leave the tarp there, but is to remove the knotweed. Um, this is what it looked, this is a site that had been tarped. Um, and we're coming back to put the tarp there in, uh, before we put the tarp back in early May. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, grasses and other small plants, um, uh, some shrubs, and you can see in the corner, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, um, uh, fiddleheads, as well as the knotweed. So other plants, and before treatment, this site was exclusively knotweed. Um, so other plants have managed to reseed the area. We didn't have to do any plantings here. Uh, the uh, natural seed bank was able to replant these areas. Um, but you can also see the knotweed, you know, right behind the sign that's beginning to come up. So this site was going to get tarped. It was tarped for about five years before knotweed uh, was no longer coming up, even after we removed the tarp. So we didn't put it back the next year. Not, we'd still manage to um, come back. Uh, this is a site that hadn't been tarped for uh, this picture I took last year in 2020. It hadn't been tarped for six years and there was no knotweed growing there. This is another site uh, that had been untarped. Um, again, we did no plantings here. We initially planned to, but when we came to do the plantings in one spring, we found that those sites were already revegetated with uh, native vegetation. We did uh, last year do a chemical treatment of a uh, aquatic formulation of uh, glyphosate. Um, I don't really want to spend too much time talking about glyphosate as it, it's very contentious and much research, but I think what we've found is when used very sparingly, it can be an incredibly effective um, 
management tool for invasive species. Here we're using on a site that had been managed for about 10 years, but was kind of stubbornly persistent. Uh, this knotweed uh, growing on the left just continued to keep coming back. Uh, so we essentially used uh, a foliar um, application of this glyphosate uh, solution to attempt to finish off and kind of eradicate um, the knotweed still on the river. Because uh, if we stopped managing it at all, the knotweed would come back pretty quickly. Um, we did this last August, at the end of August, uh, and we still don't have results for how effective this was, but we'll find out uh, next spring how effective it was. So then next I want to talk about Head of Tide just briefly. Uh, it's in Belfast on the Doak Road, um, so near town just up the uh, river from the rail trail. It's along the Pasagas Wake. And here, I think I put a slide out of order, but here in 2015, uh, the Belfast Transitions Permaculture Group, uh, which was all volunteers, approached the land trust about um, building a permaculture garden at the trailhead. So if you've been to the Head of Tide, this is the area, uh, the field right at the entrance. Um, and I have some pictures a little later in case you haven't been there. Um, so this area in red was where they ended up doing their plantings. Uh, there was a lot of work in the first uh, four years. There hasn't been much work in the last two years, uh, but the work they did has had uh, kind of really remarkable results for the uh, biological diversity in that field. Um, if you see on this picture, uh, this is one of the back fields of Head of Tide where we don't really do much except for mowing. If you compare the permaculture field uh, area to this, these back fields, which are filled with invasive species, uh, a lot of multiflora rows, for instance, uh, the species diversity is way higher in the planted area. Um, this is a bigger map of uh, head of tide. Uh, again, if you're not familiar with it, these are the back field area and the permaculture area is right here. Uh, a uh, aerial map showing the fields. Uh, and where my cursor is in the front is the permaculture area. This is what was here when they started. So it was a lot of honeysuckle and other invasive species. Um, these are some of the plants that were put into uh, the garden. Um, there's a lot of yarrow, milkweeds, joe pie weed, and other uh, types of shrubs and grasses are very present in the spring. They've effectively been un or minimally managed in the last two years, so it'll be interesting to see going forward uh, what species uh, continue to do well at the site. Um, this area is one of the uh, test, night, test sites for uh, the main pollen, New England, excuse me, pollinator project. Uh, where they go looking for a species of bumblebee every year. I uh, encountered those researchers last year. Um, and it's one of the, the sites with the most species of bumblebee in this area of Midcoast, Maine, uh, I think largely due to this planting. Um, so these are some pictures um, from the last two years, if you're not familiar with it. Um, this is looking on the right is looking back towards the road, and then on the left is looking in from the road. Um, then lastly, I want to talk about uh, McClellan poor because this has uh, both invasive species removal and uh, plantings. As I mentioned at the beginning, our plans for 2020 were somewhat disrupted um, because of COVID and then staff transitions. Uh, my predecessor, Jackie Stratton, who was managing the plantings here, uh, left and kind of in the transition, some of this work was delayed until 2021. Um, so I don't have any exciting updates that I thought I was gonna have, but I'll just give a quick summary of what we've done. Uh, again, for those who don't know, McCollin Poor is off the Herrick Road and then Route 1, as I'm sure you are all aware of where the Nordic Aqua Farms project is on the Little River. It's on the other side of the reservoir, uh, directly across from it. Uh, it's next to the Little River Vet. If you're leaving Belfast, you go by the Little River uh, dam and it's immediately on your right. Uh, it's a fantastic little trail if you haven't been there. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of uh, the Route 1 side. So here is the parking area. Uh, this is the large field area and then the trail in yellow. The knotweed is in green here. So there's knotweed both in the field and then knotweed in the forest here. Uh, this 
area was an old dump. So there's a lot of metal cans, tires, there was a car, there's a fridge, there's a lot of glass. So the knotweed was probably dumped into uh, that area and then spread from the forest into the field. This is a closer aerial. Uh, I believe this is from 2018. So you can see uh, the tarps that we've put down to manage it. Uh, we tried to go with the same uh, management strategy that we did in the duck trap. Uh, it's an enormous area uh, to tarp. It was the biggest the land trust has ever done. Um, and it's still a work in progress. We try to go um, every two weeks, but it's, it's usually been closer to once a month to pull knotweed at that site as it manages to uh, make its way through the seams and the tarps. Um, here's the parking area uh, on the right and then the kiosk you can see in the field. And we did some invasive planting, excuse me, native plantings um, last year around the kiosk, which I will have some pictures of. Uh, just for reference, this was rolling out and moving the tarps. A lot of these tarps came from uh, the duck traps. So they're recycled uh, by us. It was an enormous task to uh, set them all up. I think we had over 10 volunteers uh, working all day on it. Uh, this is a weirdly nice photograph of the tarps that a professional photographer did. Uh, as you can see around the edges, there's a lot of knotweed growing. Um, so this was probably uh, two years ago and no one had been there to pull uh, that knotweed uh, recently. Um, so it's, they're not full size plants, but they're two to three feet tall. Um, and they it, the knotweed becomes quite thick on the edges of the tarps. Um, so these need to be pulled regularly to have any success uh, removing the knotweed. Um, this is just a list of a lot of the, uh, or some of the plants that we put in that McClellan pour. Uh, some were more successful than others. We're still waiting to figure out um, which ones were successful. Um, I can say that a number of the high bush blueberries we plants, we probably put in six to eight last year. Uh, I would say only one or two have made it this year. The field's probably uh, too wet for them. Uh, and we do plan to do more plantings uh, next year if possible. Uh, this is a picture of the area of the day we were planting. Uh, so most of the things are in and around the kiosk. Um, there are little flags there. If you go looking, you're not going to find much this time of year, but hopefully come springtime. Um, we also keep this field around it mode. Uh, we try to do that every year. Um, in uh, late October um, to uh, keep it as an open field and kind of increase the species diversity. Uh, when we first got the property five years ago, there was a lot more pine, uh, poplar. There were some poplar in the field that beavers actually took down uh, two summers ago. Um, but the fields come a fair way uh, since we first took it over. Um, and we're hoping that with more plantings, we can really increase diversity in the field. Uh, another picture of the plantings, you can see the flags. Um, where the um, saplings and plants went in. Uh, this is a picture of our office. We got, uh, this was the same grant and the same round of plantings that you can also see um, some of the things we've done. These are a little clearer. So if you do visit the office, uh, take a look at the plants that are there. Um, that's all I have for my presentation. I again wanted to thank the Belfast Garden Club, especially Corliss for organiz organizing it. Margaret Campbell uh, for being the question MC, Paula Davidson for doing publicity, and Sue Connard uh, who asked me to give this talk. Brenda, uh, I would also like to thank. And I wanna thank our past Coastal Mountains managers, Jackie Stratton, Hale Morrow, and Ian Stewart, uh, who's currently our direct executive director who started these projects. And then I wanted to thank some of the volunteers who worked on them. There are many more than I can name, but I'll just give a specific shout out to those I know well, Ron Harrell, Gary and Greta Galician, Alita McKaig, Roy Call, John Kruger, Maury Hepner, and so many more. Um, so with that, uh, I'll open things up to questions. I'm going to leave uh, my contact info up on the site. If I can't answer a question or if you have any follow-ups, please uh, get in contact with me. Um, if I can't answer your question, I'll try to put you in contact with someone uh, who can. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and I think Margaret, whenever you're ready.
I think you're still muted there. Yeah, I, oh, I'm right. not, I'm okay now, right? You can hear yep, me? I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so Pat asked if you have any advice for neighbors who refuse to remove knotweed, Japanese knotweed. I think the, this is tough. The neighbor thing is really tough. It's the best advice I can give is don't try to scold or tell them that what they're doing is wrong or imply that their inaction is a problem. Uh, try to begin that conversation as collaboratively and positively as possible. Some with the land trust, we always offer to do the work. That's obviously easier for us than for some of you all. Um, but if you approach it not with this, not with a huge problem, you know, it's because of you. If, if you start negative, they're going to be really negative. Uh, try to be as positive as possible. Try to pitch, begin with benefits to both of you. Uh, and then maybe you can, um, you know, begin a collaborative relationship with your neighbor. Um, if you already have a bad relationship with your neighbor and they're, they're kind of not doing anything to spite you, um, that's a really tough situation to be in. Uh, certainly in Maine, there's there's not really any way to, to nudge or force people to take action on uh, invasive plant removal. Oops. Uh, so Amy asked if there were deadly nightshade fruits in the photo with the bittersweet. Uh, which photo? Um, I would it, have to go back. It was, watch. I think it was the one with the four pictures, but. Uh -huh. I don't believe so, um, but I also grabbed that that picture off the internet, so that wasn't um, that okay. was not on one of our properties. Uh, that was from the uh, University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension, which has a really good uh, invasive species site. I would definitely recommend that. University of Maine also does as well. So Stephen says um, he writes. My observation suggests that invasive species individuals may only become damaging when they spread and multiply. At what point does the time invested in eradication become cost effective? That's a really good question. I would agree with that. Uh, was that Paul or Stephen? I missed the name. Stephen. Stephen, I would agree with that assessment that it's only when uh, they multiply. So it really depends on your the situation on your property or the property you're managing. Um, a lot of times with the land trust, our goal is an eradication, it's just control. If we have a small number of plants who are just one plant in an area, they haven't become the kind of monoculture. If it's a field, uh, it's pretty obvious when it becomes a problem. Um, again, the cost benefit's gonna depend on you and how much work you wanna put into it. For some of those species, I would say any presence uh, is worth dealing with Japanese knotweed and bittersweet uh, in particular. Honeysuckle. Uh, honeysuckle, Courtney's coming in with honeysuckle. Uh, I would say that one is not as important partly, but on the other hand, honeysuckle is very easy to remove compared to those ones. Um, so that other, you know, the, the damage of honeysuckle or uh, oriental jewelweed isn't as high in my opinion, but they're much easier to remove while knotweed, um, it's very difficult to remove. Um, so it's going to depend a lot on your situation and what you're trying to do with the property. Um, yeah, I would say as a rule of thumb, bittersweet in particular, be as aggressive as you can be. It's fairly easy to manage uh, and can have really disastrous effect on a forest uh, or in a field. Not wheat as well, it's very hard to manage. Uh, if you can keep it out of your fields, uh, then that, that's kind of a good goal. Um, the other ones depend more on context. Okay, uh, Astrid writes, if you have these eight on your property, the most cost-effective approach is to remove immediately before they start to take over. If the species has already started a significant invasion, at least control, if not full eradication can happen and really help. The costs are not only in time, right? Calculating the costs is more complicated. 
Thank you for that answer. And I also want to have a shout out to Astrid. Uh, I did not work with her, uh, but I believe that she helped Jackie uh, with developing the list of uh, native species to plant at McClellan Poor. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but. Um, so uh, Corliss uh, writes, she asked the spelling of knotweed psyllid. Oh yes, P-S-Y-L-L-I-D. And this particular species is A. Itadori. I, I'll type that in the chat. Um, okay, Marguerite asks, uh, do we have giant hogweed or wild parsnips around Belfast? Uh, we do. Um, I, on our properties, haven't noticed that to be a big problem. I have noticed parsnips. Uh, I don't find them to be that big of a problem, but it could be on your property. Um, Cindy writes, invasive plants are spreading and multiplying all the time. We as individuals may not actually witness the spread. I often hear, oh, those Rosa Rugosa don't spread at my house, or I hear, I have that Japanese barberry under control, et cetera, et cetera. So um, interesting comment. Um, Stephen uh, writes, when introducing species, do you use seedling, seed, or some combination? Uh, we have used seedlings uh, primarily uh, with land trust. It's kind of more effective, better survival rates. Um, when we do use seeds, that's primarily not in the context of uh, planting for ecological purposes. That's primarily for uh, bank stabilization. So we'll use uh, native grass mixes um, uh, during construction projects. Okay. But if you do have a greenhouse, it's a very cost-effective way. Uh, Amy asks, where do you source your native plants? Uh, we've gotten them at local stores around here. Um, so if you know what you're looking for um, in their great lists online, uh, MOFCA has good lists. Um, mm -hmm. Maine Natural Area Programs, University of Maine, uh, Plants Unlimited, uh, Green Thrum, the basic garden stores. So Amy also asked a couple other questions. How often do you water the new plantings or do you rely on a deep mulch? I see wood chips in the photo. Yeah, so we did mulch and wood chips. Um, so mulch underneath the wood chips. Uh, those ones we only watered, uh, I think three times uh, after planting. We didn't do any watering in the summer. Um, Again, these aren't gardens, um, so we know that the mortality rate is going to be a lot higher uh, without doing that. Um, Cindy writes, thank you for this crucial work, not only for getting this critical work done, but also for the leadership. Uh, and then Astrid says, yes, she did. <laughs> thank you, Astrid. Provide plants to CMLT. Um, Marge Stickler uh, writes, are there more than one kind of jewelweed? I am familiar with the orange yellow variety that is helpful with poison ivy. Yes, yeah, so there are a number of different species of jewelweed. The easy rule of thumb uh, on your property or in any public area is that the pink, pink plants have to go and the orange one should stay. Uh, there's a very specific time of year uh, to right when the flowers begin to come out. That's before the uh, seed pods uh, are ready to erupt. If you know, you know, towards uh, kind of mid-August, if you touch one of those seed pods, it's gonna explode. Uh, so you wanna pull those plants before that, as soon as you begin to see uh, flowers coming out, pull the pink ones, leave the orange ones, because um, they're native and very beneficial all the pink ones will take over an area relatively quickly. If you haven't tried to pull jewelweed, uh, it's an absolute delight. It has one of the puniest root structures of any plant I know. Uh, you can pull pretty massive uh, stems very easily. Um, so Jack writes to everybody, A. Itadori is not weed psyllid. Okay. Uh, and Pat, uh, asked, do you recommend 
replanting at time of removal to deter re recurrence? It depends on, I, I said I would. Uh, again, it depends on your context um, and also the management technique. If you do a chemical treatment, uh, you'll want, you want to replant probably the next spring um, or the fall after the treatment. If you do a chemical treatment in, let's say, the late summer. Um, if you're doing a tarp style, it's going to take, it'll probably take a few years. Um, and so you really not want to plant anything until you're certain the tarp doesn't need to go back. Okay, Amy um, asks, is there an effort to use straight natives and not cultivars if you buy at local nurseries? Uh, there is on the part of the land trust. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're asking particularly for us or in a, a brighter, a wider, excuse me. Um, and Cindy asks, what is the CMLT plan for encouraging the private owners who have CMLT conservation easements on their properties to remove, kill all invasive plants on their lands? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. uh, we do some uh, landowner outreach. We have an owning a conservation easement a handbook that we send to uh, owners. And when a property transfers, we send that handbook to them, which has a uh, section on invasive species. We try to be kind of a helpful resource to uh, the owners of our conservation easements. Um, and we'll have one-on-one -on -one discussions. We'll help them develop plans uh, if applicable. Uh, but it's really incumbent on whether or not they want to do something. Uh, so I can think of a few easements where we've had really positive relationships and the landowners uh, begin to do a lot, uh, but more easements than not. Uh, if there are invasive species that a landowner probably doesn't do anything. We don't have an active program to contract out my time or our volunteers time or anything like that. Okay. Uh, Astrid writes that honey petal plants, which is located in Brooks, grows over 50 straight species native to Maine. So definitely that's, that's a place to go. Um, so there is a native, Astrid writes this as well, there is a native jewelweed, it flowers yellowy orange, remove the jewelweed with uh, purpley uh, pink flowers. Then Marguerite asked, can you explain stem injection for knotweed? Sure, so stem injection, uh, it's the most targeted uh, pesticide or herbicide application method. Uh, so there's an act, there's an ingester tool, in, injection tool, excuse me, that kind of looks like a, a turkey baster. It has a needle with uh, openings on the end of it. You put in a pretty high concentration um, pesticide. Uh, so it will be probably 10 times as potent as um, the solution you would use for a foliar spray, for instance. Uh, and you would actually cut the knotweed plant at about one or two feet. Uh, so there'd still be a little bit on the ground. And then you'd inject uh, in between uh, the walls of the plant into the hollow opening. Uh, you'd also mark it with a dye uh, so you could tell what you've already treated. Um, for a big patch of knotweed, you're not going to want to do this, but if it's just a few stems, uh, it's a really good idea, especially if there are other plants nearby that you don't want. You want to do, you know, a chemical treatment, but you don't want there to be any bykill. Uh, this will ensure that the herbicide is going to go down into the rhizome of the knotweed. It will be bound in the soil uh, after that, and there won't be any spread. Um, Cindy writes, Jewelweed is sort of a nickname. The difference that these are actually two different species on the main invasive plants web list and the excellent field guide, which can be bought through the state natural areas program. Yeah, and thank you for bringing that up, Cindy. The field guide is really awesome. Okay, I think we're down to the last note. Or not. You have inspired a lot of questions. Um, Raj, uh, Raja writes, injection, you 
Just a second, I'm not at the beginning of that question. Yeah, I am. Injection, you want the pesticide in the not weak tissue, not in the hollow opening, correct? The vascular tissue will transport the uh, glyl phosphate downward. If it's put into the hollow middle, it doesn't transport effectively. Uh, yeah, that, that's a very good point. Um, depending on the stem and its size, you might have more uh, success with getting it into the actual plant material uh, than not. With smaller ones, you're going to get a little bit into the plant, but it'll mostly be in the hollow. Then it would function more like a cut stem treatment. It will still be taken up by the plant, um, but uh, you're correct, Raya, that Raya, excuse me, that would be uh, more effective. Um, Susan writes, can you talk about pulling buckthorn, which is very effective? Yes, um, buckthorn is another one good for mechanical treatment works really well. Um, plant pullers, if you're familiar with that tool, uh, can be very helpful for larger plants. Uh, as you'll often find with an area with a lot of buckthorn, they'll often be a mother plant uh, surrounded by uh, smaller shoots, smaller plants. The smaller ones that are only a few feet in height, you can usually pull out with your hands pretty easily uh, or with a pigmatic or something, uh, you can get those out. The larger plants, uh, you might not be able to pull out even with a uh, kind of stump puller, if you're familiar with those things, they latch onto the base of a, a tree and then they have a lever on the other side. Uh, I recommend cutting those and either doing a cut paint um, uh, chemical treatment that you could read more about online or just cutting it that year and then coming back, it will re-sprout, uh, but will be much weaker. Um, yes, as Susan points out, a polar bar is the other name for that. Um, thank you, Raya, for the correct pronunciation of your name. Um, Astrid um, writes, impatience capensis is the native jewelweed. Impatience plantilifera is invasive. They have the same common name. Go Botany has excellent entries on both plants. And we just, we have two more questions. Um, Susan says, uh, polar bear is great. Um, and Stephen, thanks the garden club, the library, and of course, Jack. And Noreen uh, says, asks, how can I get rid of Japanese bamboo? Fallopia japonica, also burning bush. Uh, so for burning bush, I don't have a lot of experience myself. I believe that that's a fairly easy one to hand pull. Uh, knockweed is by far the hardest to remove, uh, I believe, of any invasive species in Maine. Um, I would recommend, depending on your patch size, it also a lot, it depends a lot if you have an organic garden. I understand if you don't want to do this and for other reasons, a uh, foliar application of a glyphosate um, based uh, herbicide formulation. That would be the most effective in terms of time and in terms of really controlling it quickly. Uh, an organic control for that would be cutting and covering uh, like I showed in uh, my slides. If you have questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them. That takes a lot of time though. It can take years. Um, so if you're not ready for a five plus year project, I wouldn't recommend it. So um, the uh, last, well, a couple last thank yous. Astrid, thanks you for a very informative presentation. And Noreen says thank you as well. And I'd like to add my thanks and the Garden Club's thanks. And mine as well. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. Um, so um, as we close, I'd just like to say that the uh, Garden Club and libraries uh, first co-sponsored winter evening program will be one week from today at 6.30 p.m. on uh, the 26th. It's also by Zoom and our speaker is David Yarborough and he will be talking about the history of wild blueberry growing in Maine. You can register for this at the BelfastGardenClub.org website. Um, also, Garden Club members are encouraged to attend our monthly meeting, which is at 1.30 um, following this. 
And uh, we did get a separate Zoom link for that. So, and then I should also like to remind you that next month we will have uh, two virtual programs. Uh, one on pond life under the ice from winter into spring by Edwin Barkdahl to be held on the 16th of February at noon before our membership meeting. And then also um, we're co-sponsoring with the library a, vir a virtual evening program um, on the 23rd at 6.30 by Rick Sawyer of Fernwood Nurseries. Um, and he's talking on woodland plants, natives and rarities around the globe. And you can register for this on the Belfast um, Garden Club website. So thank you for attending our first program this year. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at more of them.